excited for the conversation today with James Bloodworth. He is a journalist, writer, and the creator of the podcast Modern Dating Economy. He's also known for his journalistic work on the gig economy. So we're going to talk today about dating, mating, and the dynamics that we find ourselves in. He's done a lot of work on this and has a really interesting perspective to share with all of us. Hi, James. It's uh, Hi. good. It's great, great to be here. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. So one of the first things that catches my eye um, with your work is the name of your podcast, which is The Modern Dating Economy. So can you talk a little bit about the usage of that word, what you think it draws forth and allows us to see about the problem of modern dating? And then also, what are the drawbacks of using that term? Yeah, sure. So the reason I called the, the podcast The Modern Dating Economy, I mean, the first reason was uh, that was the best name I could I could come up with. I couldn't think of anything anything better. But it was also because uh, with, with dating apps, we have all this data now on, <clears throat> on romance, basically, essentially. We have all this data that we didn't have previously from um, more kind of spontaneous the w- ways that people got together, whether it's at a bar, a coffee shop, whatever. But 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 dating apps have furnished us with all this data, and when we come, as we're kind of getting more of this data and we're understanding it more, one of the things that, that's striking about an app like Tinder, for example, is there's this level of inequality on there. So, um, and and I, I think that one, so for example, you know the average the average man on Tinder or something is not doing very well, and then you have a small percentage of people, who, men typically, who are doing very well, and. It's quite useful. It's quite a useful metaphor when explaining this to people to kind of talk about it in terms of say compare it to a country. So like if Tinder was a country, it would be one of the most unequal countries in the world. So that's the kind of that's the utility of uh, the comparison to an economy. But I think there's a downside to it in that you can so so it can be too kind of formulaic and and if you reduce everything to it can be too reductive. So if if you if you reduce everything to kind of look at everything through this prism of of economics or whatever or uh the Pareto principle the 80 20 rule is is talked about i think it can be a bit too reductive and i think that is uh sometimes then conspiracy theories and uh radicalization can happen to people when they do go down this kind of reductive path where they think that you know dating apps uh, is, is hopeless for them to use them only a few only a certain kind of person has any chance of romance in the modern world so i think there is a pitfall to it like a dark side as well yeah i think one of the things that draws me to that metaphor although i do agree that there are limitations in terms of reducing so really highly complex uh social dynamics into economic and game theoretic term is that you're able to see the situation from a God's eye view. It kind of puts you into the perspective of looking at population dynamics, which is absolutely necessary for understanding how there are different people in this game who have different positions, right? So there's Mm -hmm. different subsets of the population like you just spoke to, that there is a subset of men who are doing quite well in this dating economy. And then there's a larger group that aren't doing as well. And so they kind of have different dynamics in the game. So could you talk a little bit about each of these different populations that you see emerging in the dating economy and what different characteristics they have? Yeah. So, I mean, there is a, there is a great deal of inequality in in online dating, let's call it. Um, And I think that I, I, I think that's real. It's, so it is a mistake to say that people are only angry because they've been fed this narrative that, that it's an economy and there's all this inequality, this kind of Pareto principle narrative or 80-20 conspiracy theory, whatever. I mean, there is an element of truth to that in, in the dating app world. So, for example, we have there's a lot of data from Tinder specifically and also Hinge, um, I believe, and OkCupid from a few years ago. That was one of the bigger dating uh, apps, you know, mid 2010s, I think it was. And there's a lot of data which shows that, uh, you know, a small number of, of I'll talk about it first from like, the male perspective, I suppose, a small number of men do, typically do very well. And I, I'd say, you know, it's obviously like men who are good looking, but it's a lot of it's to do with how, knowing how to present yourself. So you can be good looking and just not and just have like bathroom mirror selfies with, you know, flex of toothpaste on the on the mirror you know and you don't know how to present yourself so a lot of today a lot of the kind of 
uh, a lot of this world today, whether it's romance or work, is it's about how you can present yourself. It's not necessarily you know, your achievements. It's about how well you can present those achievements or present those attributes. So I think if you're not good at that, and lots of people aren't good at, uh, good at like presenting themselves, they're already going to be you know lower down the pecking order on a dating app. And the other thing I, I suppose is with dating apps, you're formalizing preferences through these very narrow uh, funnels. So I, I, I've spoken about this before, but when when I was younger, <clears throat> height was never such a big issue in terms of like being a like being a man. It, 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 like I have have friends of mine who are, you know five seven five eight, and they never really had a complex about it. I mean, yeah, some some people do, but. It was never an issue. They never thought really, oh, I'm not going to be able to find a partner because I'm I'm this height. Whereas now there seems to be this fixation on, uh, it's, it's, it's become like a meme, you know, as a guy, you must be six foot. And you see women on, on dating apps saying that you must be six foot in their profile. And I feel that that is a cultural change that's been basically brought about by dating apps. And then you have men who are who fall below that. They, they transpose that onto real life and think, I'm never going to meet anyone because all the this is what women want you have to be like six foot and stuff i mean it's it's in reality it's like it's, it's much more complex than that but i think that's one example of how um some men feel like disenfranchised by dating apps and for women i mean many women feel disenfranchised for a whole bunch of different reasons so it tends to be a barrage of kind of unwanted attention and um unwelcome approaches so you know the the, the dick pics and it's the social media thing the dick pics and just um crude like crude approaches and over sexualized objectification that kind of thing so it's men and women i think both have different challenges that like, both have challenges it's just i think they're very very different yes i mean i think that's part of what makes it necessary to put this into the frame of an economy in some sense is that every the different players in the game have very different problems women are facing different issues um some of them are very successful on these platforms. They're very good at presenting an image of themselves and they're doing quite well. And then there are men who are thrust into a different situation because of these like inherent asymmetries between the sexes that become apparent when you're looking at the dynamics in the dating economy. And then even um, in those groups, you have differences, right? Like it, it, within the group of men in particular, there's such a stark difference between the men who are let's say winning in the game, getting dates, getting attention from women and the men who are not right. And then also there's this insidious aspect of this whole situation, which is Tinder or any of these dating apps as the mediators and changing the algorithms in order to get more time on site and manipulating the people on the platforms. Um, so there's a, in a sense, they are also nudging this situation to have these kinds of population dynamics. Um, so I think that that's part of, that's part of the difficulty of the question. Um, and even why, you know, certain people get siloed into these very specific positions and they can't get out of them. Um, I'll just also say that the, for the audience, they can put questions into the chat and we'll get to them at the, at the end of a conversation. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm interested in, okay, what is happening to the male in this in this situation who is not getting access to female attention what do you see going on in our society as a result of this of this shift i think we i think we see a process of radicalization um happening i think we see that most obviously through the incel the example of the incel it's not really a community there is no incel community it's not even really a movement it's it's kind of atomized individuals who sometimes congregate on certain forums there is an ideology um but that's that's slightly different but i think you see a process of radicalization so i mean if i go back to when i was um late teenager early 20 something i lived in the countryside at the time in somerset um from uh, yeah from when i was like 17 until about 22 23 i didn't have a girlfriend i was like very I had, you know, a couple of friends, uh, but I was quite socially isolate, isolated. My social skills ten, like atrophied because I spent too much time in the house, essentially just listening to um, heavy metal and smoking weed. And funnily enough, that wasn't what women wanted. Uh, that wasn't uh, 
that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't what women were interested in. Um, yeah, believe it or not. But it, but uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, the Warhammer, the Warhammer set, and the Star Wars like set and whatever. But um, at the time, you know, I could kid myself though. I, you know, I had that ego protection mechanism, so I could kid myself and and be like, uh, you know, oh, if I wanted to, if I wanted to get a girlfriend. I could do it if I wanted to, if I really wanted to, I could find, I could meet someone and I could protect my ego that way. Whereas I think now today is very different because today you have a dating app and the bar for entry to, to, to create a profile on the dating app and to log on is much lower than it was in my day to say, go and approach a woman in a bar or a coffee shop. So that would take, you'd have to pluck up a lot of guts to, to do that. And it would, it, the rejection could be, could be brutal and, you know, you have to go through quite a lot to, to do that if you've not done that before. Whereas with the dating app, the, the bar for entry is very low. So anyone can set up a profile. But then if you don't know how to present yourself, if you are kind of near the bottom of the hierarchy, so to speak, in terms of what, what works on the dating app, you, you then enter a essentially a negative feedback loop and your identity is formed within that negative feedback loop. So it's revealed to you where you sit in, in the hierarchy and I'm kind of glad I didn't have that reveal, revealed to me when I was uh, like a 19 year old or, or whatever. Um, and I think what's happening today is you do get that. You, it's, it, you, it's kind of rubbed in your face a bit more. So the, the sheer volume of rejection on a dating app. Um, I mean, I've, I've had friends um, who know I talk about this stuff sometimes who've then contacted me and said they've had to delete dating apps because it's affected their mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then I, I think there is this kind of, ready-made ideology with the incel community say the black pill it's called this kind of very deterministic uh, ideology which says that you know only a certain type of only someone with you know a certain jaw uh jawline is gonna just trying to think of of some celebrity with the like stereotypical jaw like the chad jawline or like the six foot six foot two chad or whatever they're the only it's, it's like the stereotypes the only person who has any chance of finding a partner and they're the ones and also then there's a conspiracy theory like you feel like everyone else is having sex but you're not and i think that's also uh propagated by the kind of instagram world of like the dambles areas of the world where it's rubbed in your face these men who seem to have this like incredible lifestyle and you're comparing yourself to those men and i think yeah that sends people down into this right can do into this uh pit of despair mm-hmm. yeah it's interesting it feels like in a way men are kind of facing a similar situation that women have been in for millennia, which is being judged by their innate beauty rather than the qualities of their character. And that being such a massive force in terms of having bidirectional selection. So it seems that there is a kind of, uh, situation occurring for men where they're they're having to face similar problems as women um where attractiveness is becoming more increasingly the primary currency of interpersonal attention does is that something that you've seen in your research that looks and beauty is coming up as a more prominent value for people in terms of mate selection on both sides both men and women Yes, I mean, I, I definitely think it is because I think what we're talking about when we talk about like good looks, it's something that to some extent it's it's something that's biological and inherent that there are certain traits which, you know, cross-culturally men and women tend to find attractive. So, you know, women tend to, um, you know, if you look cross-culturally, there tends to be more of a preference for say like high status men within positions of high status and men cross-culturally, it tends to be a preference for women who are close to like their most fertile years basically um but there are, there are also lots of things which are socialized and i think one one in, interesting example of that is david in david buss's book the evolution of desire there's a very interesting statistic which is uh in every decade since the television since the television age started um people have rated the importance of good looks in a relationship m- more because image and presentation has become more important and i think if I mean, I, I assume that social media, I believe social media has done that, accentuated that even more. So good looks almost become like a status, a form of status in their own right. So I think that having kind of uh, arm candy or whatever for men and women has become more of a, 
because you're more likely to be appear in photos and they're more likely to go on Instagram or whatever in your grid. And then you, 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 you show off your partner. It's, it's kind of like a, a symbol of status in its own, own right that you have a, um, a physically attractive partner. And I think social media has, has definitely played a massive role in that and exa- and accentuate it. I think it's much more of a looks or have become more important than, than they used to be, or have become more of a symbol of status. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that that this kind of speaks to the dark side of the metaphor, right? Um, the use of the word economy, I think, is a quite common one in our society to, to understand things in terms of economic language. And it's, it's almost as if uh, dating itself has become li- made into a lifestyle, right? So your interpersonal interactions have gone through this kind of lifestyle uh, transformation. It's about your ability to advertise your position and status. So in a way, you know, the connection between the economy and advertising has actually insidiously integrated itself into interpersonal dynamics between people. And while, you know, there is a dimension of life that's about showing off and showing your position and getting scarce resources and demonstrating that as part of your status, there's also interpersonal relationships and skills and values and living an <laughs> abundant life full of things that are going to make you feel content. Um, and also potentially the desire to have a family in the mix. So what do you see as being the purpose of <clears throat> dating as such now? Like, has that even changed to be something that's not so focused on the outcomes of family and um, building community through dependable pair bonds? but rather is also morphing into this like kind of lifestyle um, advertising campaign for one's own personal brand or status. Like what, what do you see going on with the way our values are shifting around relationships due to this technological change? Mm-hmm. I mean, the first, I, I kind of want to visit, revisit some old, I mean, Zygmunt Bauman, the sociolo- sociologist, he, he died like quite recently, but he, uh, he, a few years ago, he, I remember reading one of his books in like 2008 or something um, and it was called Liquid Love and it was about kind of a th- the throwaway capitalist culture um, moving into the realm of like relationships and where there's always kind of, you're always looking for something better on the horizon and like you trade you up, you trade up a partner for, or trade in a partner for, for, for a different one. And it's like, like a kind of throwaway disposable culture. Um, and I think that was kind of prescient in, many ways I, I need to I feel like I need to revisit it um in light of dating apps because I mean I don't want to sound too much like a trad or or something because I'm I'm not really um I'm, I'm more of a liberal I think people should pursue what makes them happy if that doesn't sound too wishy wishy-washy um but it's it does feel a bit like like personally I would like to settle down at some point it's uh I feel like there is that kind of deeper connection you can build with someone that isn't just the ephemeral app you know based hookup or whatever i think i feel like there is there is more of a richness to life when you can form a real connection with someone uh, but i think that that the, the dating apps don't get rich off of happily ever afters so it's it's they they kind of um well first of all they they there's there's some kind of kind of scam going on where people pay money for for upgrades on these on these apps and stuff and then when they stop paying for this like extra package on there, they suddenly stop getting uh, matches. And it's almost as if they're, you know, that once they've paid, if they hadn't paid, they would have still carried on getting matches once they have. I mean, I've heard this from quite a lot of people. There's this kind of people are hooked in to kind of stay on there. And there's always this kind of grass is greener mentality that, you know, um, like the paradox of choice where someone could be perfect for you in, in many ways, but, it's like, what if, what if I'm going to meet, I could just go and meet someone else tomorrow. It's like, I mean, this, this is true in real life in a place like Las Vegas, but in like normal, normal life, it wasn't really true. I don't think and for many people until the advent of dating apps. Um, I mean, all my friends in, in Las Vegas pretty much are sing- permanently single um, because the, the environment, there is that kind of paradox of choice. It's so easy to just go out and meet someone. And I think dating apps kind of, um, make that something that's kind of applicable everywhere in some ways, which I don't think that's really a good thing. I think you can't have too much choice in some ways. Well, not too much choice, but you can badly um, use the choice. You know, you can, we're humans after all, we're not 
no one is like perfectly disciplined all the time we have kind of flaws and we we act on our emotions more than our logic i think and uh yeah i, I don't think too much i think there is such a thing sometimes is too much choice yeah um i also think you know it's very it's a very common uh talking point to discuss attention um in in the internet economy right like that is the scarce resource attention itself that is the thing that we're all competing for that's why you see so much clickbait these things just like trying to aggressively draw you in and sex is also also obviously a part of this but attention itself is as a scarce resource and what is dating besides getting the attention of a specific person um, in a bi-directional way so that you can begin to form longer bonds of attentional resources, right? And the way that I think about this is that there's been an abundanceification of relationships, a recontextualizing of relationships so that they actually appear to have this characteristic where they're interchangeable and they are, you know, uncontained, that you can have many of them. And to have one is not to exclude the possibility of having others, that you can have them all simultaneously. Um, and, and of course, this must be what's happening, because when we're looking at the proportions between men and women having dates, let's just say, or getting attention, there are a few amount of men, and there are many women. So there must be some sharing of partners going on in the situation, or else the math doesn't just add up. Um, and it seems to go against this fundamental characteristic of human interaction, which is that there is a limited amount of time, there is a limited amount of attention, and also how we spend our time changes how we behave. And the behavioral aspect of this, I think, is interesting in terms of its externalities for other parts of our society, not just dating as such, but also how are we holding communities together? How are we holding promises into the future? How are we bringing forth children into the world? Are, are we going to have the stable society, pro-social society that we would all prefer to live in if we continue down this path? So what do you see as being some of the destabilizing effects of this type of interpersonal interaction kind of spreading um, and also training young people who don't have you know, more lived experience that this is the way things are? What do you think about that? I mean, just to just to take the question in like the reverse order, mm -hmm. I think one of the one of the issues with dating apps is it's creating this idea. It's creating this somewhat false idea in the minds of young men, in particular, that the things, the way it works on dating apps, is the way it works in the real world. Um, I mean, it is to an extent, uh, but it's there's also lots of there are lots of there are many differences. So. Um, I think that, the, for example, I have friends who don't do well on dating apps. And so they don't bother with that because they, 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 they don't present themselves well in that way. They're not like, quite a bit photogenic or, or whatever. But many of these people have ha gone out and dated very attractive people they've met in real life because they may be very charismatic. They may have, uh, they do, may just have that vibe about them. They, they may be I, I I don't really know how to put it like vibe. They just have they just have that that magnet that personal magnetism. Magnet, yeah. They have yeah they have something. And I think dating apps what they do is because there is this this kind of steep uh, inequality on dating apps. They people people like young men who who go on there and then they they get you know they go on for a couple of afternoons get like burned through like a hundred rejections essentially. They transpose that onto real life and, and think that this is how it is in the real world. And I also think generally our app-based culture, our internet culture, I think it's it's doesn't kind of lend itself to improving your social skills. I think I learned from when I was younger, when I spent a lot of time in, in indoors, and also during lockdown, that if you don't, like your social, your social skills are like a muscle. If you don't, um, if you don't use them, they, they atrophy. And you can become better socially i mean i was someone who had to work really hard on my social skills uh when i was in my early 20s and i went out a lot and um it's you know people would say that's weird that i went out with a specific intention of improving my social skills um there's the kind of one incarnation of that was like the pickup artist community which is seen as something very toxic nowadays but the point is it filled a void because there was no one kind of showing people how to improve your social skills there was um 
there's kind of a, the mainstream doesn't the mainstream advice for like young men in particular is very outdated so it's it tends to be um say like stuff handed down from our parents which came from a different world handed down from a completely different environment like you'll meet someone in your local community you'll you'll just find someone or is this disney disneyfied um world where you know oh the, the you know the one your one true love is out there fate will take care of it your one true love is out there waiting f- for you somewhere and it's just nonsense historically societies where polygamy has been the norm that's where where one man has has many wives or, or partners those societies have tended to be much more unstable um, than societies where monogamy has been has been the norm because you essentially because you have a a mass of men who a mass of incels essentially you have the equivalent of historical equivalent of incels where uh, they are very unhappy and then they often get sent abroad so the Vikings you you often they would send their single unmarried men abroad to fight in wars even in recent times you have with ISIS you've had the promise of to lure to lure young men to uh, the Middle East has been the promise of of essentially having sex slaves, um, and you, you know men who men I, I guess like men's men's purposes in life is in modern society even as a man your kind of your two purposes is to be able to earn a living and find a partner. So I mean, whereas women tend to be uh disparaged for having too many sexual partners men it's it's the opposite you know if they can't find a sexual partner they're kind of mocked as a virgin or an insult and you even you even see that today it's incel has become an insult used by people and it doesn't just it isn't just directed at extremists it tends to be used in a way to kind of um malign someone's masculinity because yeah they, they can't find a partner because he's, as a man you're supposed automatically to be able to well i'd say three things have a productive job, win a fight, and find a find a partner. Those three things you're supposed to be able to do automatically. And due to the changes in like the structure of society, especially now, I mean, many men are finding that much harder in terms of finding a partner. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Uh, and then, okay, so what if, what do you think of as being destabilizing for women in this context? What how is the inequality affecting? how women are behaving or experiencing the world i mean first of all it's destabilizing for women because the radicalization it tends to impact women these men tend to get very angry and then take out that resentment on women so that would be the first obviously consequence of this that you know having lots of resentful men running around is is inherently like a threat to women i also i also think um i also think that that the the dating apps in some ways they benefit they benefit the kind of uh, a, a small percentage of men the most I would say because I, I think women women have kind of like the following the sexual revolution you know women no longer have to marry uh, typically in the West women no longer are forced to marry someone they're not attracted to which was was the case for for many decades because for financial reasons they needed someone to to support them because they couldn't enter the workplace that would be the most a, a basic reason why that why that happened um so so with say dating apps a woman can have at least like the the kind of theoretical possibility of interacting with the like the top guys um however women tend on balance be more inclined towards relationships whereas men tend on balance to be and this is averages everyone's different but on average men tend to be to want to spread it around essentially so to want sexual variety and so i think you have a situation where it's very easy for the kind of the men who do well on dating apps to essentially use those women to kind of lead them on and use them and have no intention of having a relationship with them but kind of uh, pretend as it were that they that they do and again it's like this is this is a generalization like i mean there are lots of women on dating apps for just for hookups it's, it's like it's, it's it's a myth that it's just like just men uh doing that it's but it's more just like we're talking averages i think that um tends to be like women leaning a bit more towards relationships than men and i think they tend to lose out on some of these dating apps because it's very easy for the kind of the the top guys on there to pretend that they want a relationship, lead them on, sleep with them, and then ghost them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, exactly. There's like this heterogeneous mix of people 
you know, um, on the, on the apps, right. You have men who are looking for long-term relationships. You have women looking for long-term relationships. And then you have the people who are looking for more short-term hookups and they're all using the same interface in order <laughs> to try and find each other. And the dynamics of the interface itself of the mediator do not favor the kind of long-term, uh, mindset of any of the individuals playing on the platform. Um, there's a nudging towards this optionality dynamic because it keeps people on the apps for longer. So do you think that this is the leverage point? Do you think if we were to delete all dating apps that this problem would go away? Or is it this contributing to an already present kind of social decline or uh, like fall of coordination, right? That something has happened upstream of the dating apps that's then kind of being reinforced by this technological shift. What is what do you see as being the kind of leverage points in terms of causality of this of this situation? I mean I think dating apps play a play a big role, but I'd also say that um the problem wouldn't just go away because if you if you got rid of dating apps, the problem is you have, I think on average, younger people's social skills have got poorer with the advent of technology i think there's i think there is i can't you know don't quote me on any uh, don't quote me on this necessarily but i think it's i i'm fairly sure i've seen data on on this showing that that kind of young people's social skills um has kind of declined along with the as their screen time has kind of gone up and it, and it makes sense if you're like i know from personal experience if i'm interacting with people just through a screen and i'm not going out and actually uh, meeting in person i feel like my kind of social calibration as it were that that gets worse and so i think you have an issue anyway if you got rid of dating apps i mean how many people would would know how to kind of competently approach someone they like in in a bar or somewhere or or you know without without being you know heavily intoxicated or something how many people would would feel confident to do that and then you also have from the from the woman's perspective uh you have a sense that kind of in some ways the public space is not not a safe place uh, so you have, um, I think it's an, an attitudes have changed in terms of in terms of this. So you have there was a Guardian article um, last year, I think it came out, which showed that I think seventeen percent of young people believe that even approaching a man approaching a woman in a bar or any any setting like that constitutes sexual harassment. So you know this is not you know a boss using his power to kind of. Um, to try and kind of take advantage of someone who works for him. This is, you know, a, a man approaching a woman in a bar. 17% of young people think that's sexual harassment. I mean, that that to me is, seems seems quite crazy, but I think there is, and I don't really think this is something that if you, if you went out, I don't think this is really, um, and you're not creepy or weird, I don't think this is an issue that's going to come up, but you do speak to men and they think that this is a, a widespread attitude that, oh, they, they dare not kind of approach because you can't do that anymore. Um, and I don't know where that's come from. I think that's too much time on social media because yeah. I think you very much can if you go out and, and you're not, again, not weird. Um, it's perfectly possible still to meet people like that. Um, but I think um, there's this kind of, we've just become more separate and we stay in more and we don't go out as much and we think we can just do it through the app. And um, if you got rid of the apps, I think we'd have to relearn how to how to meet people again. It's like, it doesn't, it's not just like we'd automatically be able to do that because it's hard anyway. It's hard at the best of times. Um, so you'd have to kind of relearn how to do that. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I, I think so. That's definitely a thing. But I think also just more generally, like, like you point out, people just spending more time online as such is creating um, emotionally fragile individuals who then when they go out into the analog environment, into the world where we're bodies and there's emotions and there's like unpredictable interaction, uh, you have no idea how the woman's going to react and you only have the ideas of the things that you've heard online, right? Kind of in your head. I think this also gets into the dating advice thing. Like there's a whole kind of economy around telling you like the way that it is in terms of how dating works or like how women work or how men work. And a lot of it, and I've dug through a bunch of this on YouTube is just it's just a grift. It's literally copy paste advice. You're not getting anything of any substance in terms of how to have real interactions with people. And it is very similar to what you said. It's like, 
there's this mythology or kind of fan fantastical environment around what it is to be in a relationship, how to look for a relationship. There's just the one out there or like be yourself. Like, what is that supposed to mean? Be yourself. Like, <laughs> especially if you don't have any social skills, <laughs> like, yeah. if it, if it's like, so <laughs> what do you think about that? Set, like kind of the feeders off of this uh, situation, the people who are kind of using this uh, problem, this widespread social problem as a economy to drive their own kind of advice columns or, um, you know, brands online as dating coaches, have you looked into any of like what people are telling other people, how the per perverse kind of dynamics in, in that environment as well? Yeah. I mean, that is something that, that I have taken an interest in over the years. I mean, I think, I don't think it's all bad. I think that it feels, I think it fills a void. I mean, I th the thing is, I think the mainstream advice is such garbage. Um, it's just, it's just terrible. So mainstream advice is be yourself. Well, what if you have been yourself and it hasn't worked? What what do you what do you do then? I think like there is a truth to be yourself, but it's like be your best self. And again, I don't want to sound too much like a self help bro or something, but I mean, be your best self is is kind of how you you know how you are when you're with your friends when you um, when you feel relaxed and you don't feel stifled and you feel like you can bring your personality out. Um, and sometimes you know you sometimes you do need to work on your personality. You like all of us have issues and some kinds of issues. And sometimes there are things we need to kind of iron out of our personalities. But I also think that there is a lot to be said for kind of um, working on yourself in that way. But also I think there is like so much of the mainstream advice is this kind of um, disnified idea that, Oh, just someone should love you for who you are. Um, whereas I think that what the reason why the, the dating coaches get business is because many people have tried that that right you know when they're younger they've tried just being themselves and it hasn't worked and it hasn't got them anywhere and the dating coaches i mean yeah there's a lot of like grift in that space there's there's a ton of grift there's a ton of marketing like bs in in that space but there's also it's the only kind of area which is only kind of space which is willing to to tell people how that dating is often counterintuitive mm -hmm. so the mainstream will um, spin this kind of fairy tale that the real, the way you get someone is by just being nice. You just be nice to someone, but actually being like, you should be nice. You should be a nice person. I, I'm fully in favor of people being nice to each other, but um, it's got very little to do with whether someone's attractive. I mean, you can be, and I, and I don't mean that in the cliche of, you know, like, Oh, the assholes are the ones who, who, who get the girls or whatever. And I, I don't mean that, but I mean that, niceness doesn't just, just bears a very little relation to that so so lots of dating counterintuitive so you can be too nice you can be too needy um and sometimes some active disinterest can be an actually uh, can be a powerful thing and people don't like to hear that because it sounds because you're breaking it down into kind of its constituent parts so it sounds oh do you, this is like manipulation or um you're kind of you're demystifying it which again people do not like romance and love demystified because they have this uh, you know, the most in intellectual academic people, when it comes to love, they will not have it demystified. Um, but I think if you're someone who just doesn't know what the hell is going on, which is the position I, I came from when I was when I was younger, is like I didn't really like flirting is counterintuitive. Flirting is teasing someone. And I never used to understand how, um, you know, why, why would you just not be nice to each other? Why, why would why would some two people who like each other just be mean, like be, be mean to each other? But, be, but, you do, but then you learn and you understand there are different levels of communication going on. There is like, on one level, it's ostensibly you're being mean and teasing someone. But on the other level, the subcommunication, there's, there's this other kind of dance going on. And the reason why dating coaches exist is because the mainstream just will not touch this. And I think also that men in particular, well, well men are expected to approach. So men are the ones who expe are expected in our society to take the initiative typically. Um, that's changing to some extent, which is, I think it's good um, because women are often shamed when they, when they approach it's, you know, they're, they're easy or whatever. Um, but I think that men are the onus is on men to, to approach. So, and men also have an ego about asking for advice on how to do this. So uh, you either have resentment, you have people following the mainstream narrative, which is doesn't work. And then you have dating coaches and the pickup artists and whatever that comes up to fill that gap because, um, the mainstream just 
just is is kind of terrified of this area and it's this but yeah i mean that's where we are i think with that yeah definitely great well we're going to move over to audience questions there's a bunch of really interesting questions in the chat um so if you asked a question kind of be prepared for me to call on you so you can unmute yourself and um speak your question aloud or if you want me to, to ask it on your behalf you can just indicate that in the chat um we're going to start with max's question uh, which we kind of started talking about while you were away but we'll get we'll get your ideas in this as well so max do you want to unmute yourself and ask um so what do you think would be a better way to do uh, online updating you know what will be uh in a ideal world, you know, the healthiest dated app that you can possibly imagine. Should I take that straight away? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I think the, the apps that exist already, I think that Hinge is much better than Tinder, for example, because I think that apps where you can display some more personality, I think is, is, is a better option. Like, I mean, I think that like, I met my girlfriend through Hinge. I think this is, it is a better app. I mean, I think that there is a possibility of these things getting better because as technology improves, you, you do have the option of things like virtual reality and virtual reality, like instant dates and, and things like this, where it isn't just about your picture. It's a, it can be about something like you can, you can convey your personality. So I think that like dating apps as they are, Tinder especially, and you could also say Instagram in some ways, it, it creates this, this idea and, and, I feel myself succumbing to it sometimes that, that all that matters is like what you look like in society today. All that matters in terms of getting a partner is, is, is your physical appearance. And um, I don't think that's true. Like really I from experience, if I, if I think about it and, and, and like, you know, go back in into my history and the history of many of my friends and people I've spent time with researching this, it's not really true. It, it, it really isn't true. But uh, so I think that the apps that kind of lend themselves to more of a display of other facets of your personality, I think that's uh, that would be more beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Max, do you have a follow up or anything? I mean, not question, but your opinion. Yeah, I think uh, for me, face to face, uh, you know, like this medium in a way, it's so much better to understand the person and, and voice as well. I agree. Uh, I think, um, yeah, uh, like the real personality is, is the movement in a way that just text uh, without all the context, uh, I think is there's not enough bandwidth to it. So maybe video, maybe video is the future of um, dating. I don't know. Cool. All right, we're going to go to Kathleen. Thanks, Max, for your question. Do you want to mute yourself and ask your question? Okay, I think we hear her. If not, I'll start reading it for, for her. Okay, I'll do that then. Um, let me see. So this is what she's asking about. There is a great episode from Jordan Peterson with Rob Henderson that touches on the issues and in relation to polyamory, yet another space that has more emphasis to keep you on the app rather than into a relationship. I'd love to hear some solutions or dating spaces that work. My current thinking is just to do more stuff that isn't dating is a good idea, but as most people who are dating are using apps, I think it would be not so good at spontaneous real life meeting. So do you think that, um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm kind of interested in, uh, do you have any thoughts on polyamory itself, like as a kind of subculture within the larger kind of dating structures or any comments on um, Rob and, and Jordan Peterson, who I don't know if you've watched their interview. Um, I, I know Rob's uh, work and obviously I know Jordan Peterson's yeah. work. Like how could I, how could I not really? Um, yeah, exactly. Do I have thoughts on like polyamory? Um, I mean, if it works, if it works for the person, it's, it's, I mean, could it would it work for me I'm, I'm not really sure it's like i think it's a personality type i think it's some people those things people have different levels of kind of jealousy and 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 whatnot and i think um some people that's not such an issue and that i think that's that that's totally cool with me if if, if they want to do that like i don't know because it's like i've never been in that kind of relationship i've had like casual things before 
but there's always kind of a bit of like jealousy creeps in even if you are like ostensibly like casual so i don't know if it would be for me but um i mean rob henderson and uh they were talking about polyam polyamory or, or dating app inequality they were they were talking about kind of both of those things and luxury beliefs as well um which i think does tie into this in terms of like status demonstrating status and like having kind of ideas about relationships that don't actually give you tools for navigating them properly um and that kind of being a cost for the people who carry those ideas so this is kind of like what you're talking about in terms of ideology being in the mix here um that in a way our our, our ideas about uh relationships are a kind of fashion uh you know like the the kind of red pill world like that in some sense that's a kind of ideological fashion where if you were to try and implement those ideas in the real world it's very unlikely that you would end up with a high quality woman <laughs> you know it's like you actually are not going to get the thing that you want if that's the ideology that you prescribe to and yet we find lots of people kind of engaging in this i mean it, for women it would be like believing that all masculinity is toxic masculinity or having these ideas about the way men need to be believing that men shouldn't approach women because it's harassment, but then also at, in real life, actually wanting men to, to approach you and in real life, actually wanting a masculine kind of man, you know? So like the, the, the ideology gives you counterintuitive kinds of ideas about what it would actually be like to be in the environment. That's a lot of what they ended up talking about. Uh, and I think that that's a really interesting part of all of this, because just like the dating advice, you have almost kind of an ideological political commentary that's happening that's mixed in with the commentary on the way that it is, you know, and that's like, it's the ontology of dating. And then from there, you get to the aughts, like what you ought to do about it. So that's kind of what they're talking about. I don't know if you have a riff on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think some of the i think some of the ideal ideologies can be like a cope basically sometimes so like a coping mechanism so i mean the red pill stuff i think some of that can be a cope in that so you have this the red pill stuff strikes me it, it tends to be men like a bit older than myself like <clears throat> who are very like embittered by their experiences with 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 women and they tend to like the red pill stuff is about a cope like women are going to hit the wall they say you know women are going to hit the wall at 35 and then they then they will see what it's like to be like to feel how i felt in my when i was younger that's what that's what kind of i i feel that energy behind some of the like red pill stuff and the reaction to the only fans uh so recently when only fans announced that they were <clears throat> banning pornographic content and then they they, they did perform a u-turn but in that brief window when they announced they were banning pornographic content uh, you had um, you had this like celebration in like the red pill community where they're saying, oh, this is, you know, this is these women are going to go have to work in like McDonald's now and like, ha, 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 you know, the, and all this stuff. And it's just like a revenge fantasy. It's like revenge for like the girls who turned them down in high school uh, or whatever. It's like this kind of weird, like bitter energy. Yeah. And, but I, th I think I don't think it's just the red pill. I think all I all. Not all, but I think lots of ideologies which engage with this space can be guilty of that. So, yeah. I mean, I think one of the problems we have is that on the one hand, mainstream society tends to take this very social constructivist view. So the blank slate that it's kind of almost like passe to talk about that men and women have different kind of sexual strategies and some of the stuff like the, science, the, the evolutionary psychologist, David Buss, He's written some very interesting books. I mean, The Evolution of Desire. Uh, he recently wrote a book on male violence called Bad Men. Um, and he's written a book called Why Women Have Sex as well. With, with um, It was him and a, a female author wrote this. And this stuff is like fascinating. And he's like a pioneer in this area. He's like a fairly progressive like guy. He's not like this kind of deterministic like right winger. He's very interested in... So in, in Bad Men, he... he talks about how positive the developments are in Scandinavia in terms of reducing um, male violence against women. As you, when you have a more egalitarian society, um, it becomes easier to address some of those um, causes of like toxic masculinity. 
Um, but there's there's kind of no engagement with with that like material really from feminism, for example. It doesn't really engage in that material or progressive, the progressives don't really engage in it because they don't want to kind of, they fear opening this Pandora's box, which acknowledges that there are some kind of different psychological differences between men and women, mainly I would say in, when it comes to sexual selection, because we have a different role in terms of, um, in terms of our kind of men and women obviously have a different role when it comes to come to reproduction. And those things obviously influence our mate choices. Like is it, why is it easier for a man to go and sleep around? Because the co- he doesn't bear the costs of a pregnancy historically for millions of years. He did not bear the costs of that. He could do that and then just flee. Whereas a woman has to be more discerning because she then has to carry that pregnancy. So yeah, I, I do think that you do like some of this stuff can be like really deterministic in terms of like the red pill and, uh, the, some some of the stuff that, you know, the just so stories that come out of the uh, certain right wing kind of quarters. But I think there's a problem in the progressive space where if you don't acknowledge that men and women have different like approaches when it comes to finding a partner and they like different things. I just think you you, you can't even begin to discuss the challenges that both sexes face in, in this space because you, you can't even grapple with it because you don't understand why things are happening. You don't understand things are happening. And you have to, and then because you don't understand it, you have to spin the ideology even more and go deeper down the rabbit hole and find these new ideological reasons to, to make yourself right, if that makes sense, because you will not acknowledge that um, there are, we approach dating differently, men and women. Women have fears that men do not have. So women fear violence in a way that men do not have. Um, men overestimate women's interests. So this is a, uh, something that David Buss has written about. So men... Um, will think a woman is interested in them um, when they aren't, they're just being friendly. Um, and this is uh, something that's, that occurs, the theory is, through evolution because it's very bad for a man to miss a chance to, to find a mate. It's like costly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think understanding these things, it, it does help us to kind of, I think it helps men to address their behavior because if men have a kind of over-perception bias and, and we know that, then I think it kind of, you kind of, I think it makes you stop and think a bit more if you're making, you might be making a woman feel uncomfortable. And I think that's, um, that's a progressive direction, direction we want to go in. But I think to, to, to kind of understand that and, and, and move in that direction, you have to understand what the hell is going on in the first place and why it's happening. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important, um, critique and something that's missing because if you can't like, this goes back to the, there being different populations and different players in the game and them having different attributes and therefore they have different moves they can make and they have different ultimate desires. Like unless you have the categories of man and woman or male and female, and you understand that there are some constraints in terms of their attributes, you cannot begin to model the complexity of these interactions. You just don't have the tools. Um, And we do have the tools coming out of evolutionary psychology to at least sketch out a framework for what could possibly be happening on these more like game theoretic levels and explanations for why this might be the case that is rooted in biological adaptation. Obviously we have continuous with that cultural values and beliefs that have changed mating so much for human beings throughout time. You know, that has just been something highly mutable continues to be, and we do have access to that layer to change the way that we behave Um, But we can't, doing it in a counterproductive way to the constraints of our nature is not helping us exit this coordination problem. And instead, it's, I feel like it's digging us deeper in the hole. Uh, Because like it or not, the, the kind of progressive story about the nature of men and women is the dominant and high status story. And so that is the thing that's causing people to understand the world in a certain type of way. That's why people are going underground to these alternative networks to get advice. That's why there's this black economy of like dating advice and the black pill. Like it creates this kind of dynamic. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Great. Yeah. I just love that point. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, and I think just like very briefly, it's yeah, the, the more this is like the, the more denialism there is, then the more you kind of funnel people down to down these, these routes to these, um, these communities, these fringe communities, because it just fills such a big void and people, people have like, you can, you can, it's a bit like, you know, when in a communist state or something, and again, I'm not kind of 
I don't want this to sound like hyperbole and, you know, oh, these people are like the new Maoists or like you hear this, this rhetoric sometimes. But I think it's, you know, you have the official ideology, but then people go out into the real world and see that that is just not how things pan out. And that that can make you very resentful because these people are just lying to me. It feels like these people are lying to me. And then you seek alternative like truths and then you, you find these gurus and you can be led down a different dark path. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And all of these things are destabilizing all of them. Like it's not just the apps. It's not just the uh, denial of reality that's happening in any given kind of ideological corner. It's the, all of these kind of directional movements that people are going in that's eroding this kind of like higher level order that and cohesion that we had kind of inherited from the past, but the internet and it's kind of decentralized multi-dimensional kind of movement, I think has really provided the opportunity for people to just run into these corners um, that, and is highly destabilizing on this larger level. Um, okay, well, we're gonna go to another question. I just like got really excited about this line of thought. Um, I do not know how to pronounce this person's name. So uh, many apologies, hopefully you- can... Must be me. It is you, how do you say your name? <laughs> Gerge. Okay, great. Go for it. <laughs> uh, let me remind myself. Uh, because, yeah, you mentioned at some point, like, the, the specificity of our search was the phrase, and I think, uh, I think, and the example you used was, like, whatever, that height, for example. And uh, it seems to me like there are some parallels, like, in natural processes where, like, so there's some urge, whatever, let's say, like, I want a tall mate. And then usually there's, like, this, there's only so much around and that provides the upper barrier for this drive. So in this, so in this, so like, let's say, you know, you grow up in the village and, you know, there are the women who are around and what you, what you desire is like the type of mate you would want for yourself is informed by what you see as available. Whereas in the dating apps like this, you're, you're free to a kind of conjure up an ideal and that maybe she exists, maybe she doesn't, but here's the plenty of fish. In, in the entire ocean. So do you, are there any sort of tricks and tips maybe you picked up to manage this disconnect? Or, yeah, I think that's as best as I can ask it this late in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, like manage the disconnect as in like do better on dating apps or like, <laughs> oh, all right, what do you mean kind of? Um, mm, to more to not, not let your, uh, like, let's say, not like your own like fantasies get away with you to be seeking something that may not actually exist and keep it in line with actually like okay but in my reasonable neighborhood what is actually reasonably available yeah yeah no I, I get you i think i think in a way like not getting kind of sucked into society like someone else's value system in some ways so i mean i think that, that there's a part of me which which feels like that like i get drawn into someone else's value system sometimes and i think I think we can do that with dating. So, I mean, I've dated people before where I, I, when I kind of thought about it more, I was dating them more to impress my friends than because that was someone I actually liked. Well, not liked, but like that someone I could connect with on like a deep level. So you have to, I feel like you have to know yourself and know what you're really into yourself. And I don't think, it, I think very often it isn't what, it isn't the kind of uh, things that society says are the, you, know, you, you this is what that you should be interested in this i think we're all different i think we all do have yeah there are like averages so on average men tend to like these things and on average women tend to like these things but we all have our type and i think once we allow ourselves a kind of the freedom to kind of experiment with that and we kind of disconnect from the matrix without saying like a conspiracy theorist but we disconnect we kind of detach ourselves from the matrix and and stop kind of you know understand what's our own uh, preferences and what's kind of society's preferences or you know what society thinks is attractive i think that's where more freedom lies basically i, I mean in my own case that's uh that did take a bit of work to figure that out like what i actually like what what works for me versus what i thought i liked but it was actually something that i'd kind of uh, um, imbibed from like society society's values yeah, if that I answers the question i just wanted to make that point so <laughs> Hopefully, it, it kind of answers the question. A bit. I think it does, but maybe not in the terms I was expecting. But yeah, 
because yeah maybe that step is to recognize like oh shit maybe it isn't actually what what i'm chasing but okay never mind. yeah thanks is the short time i would say um that there, this there's a fundamental problem with desire um that you could approach from a multitude of different perspectives uh, i think that we are kind of thrust into the question of what is our nature and being social we're picking up the desires of others um, quite extremely in terms of developing our own behavior and our own sense of what's worth what's what's valuable um, in the society around us and because we're inherently relational as a species um, the paradigm of individualism i think gives us bad intuitions about what it is to actually achieve a fulfilling human life and so I think a lot of what this has thrust us into is like very fundamental questions about what it means to be human and desire as part of this set of questioning, because desire is this kind of the eros that drives interpersonal interaction that gives us this boost, this like this drive to actually reach out into the unknown and attempt to do something that we don't understand what the outcomes of it are going to be. We have no security when we're when we're trying to reach for a lover. We only know that we have this drive in us to go for them. And I think that that kind of question of what do you desire? What are in your fantasy worlds? Are you spending so much time in your fantasy world constructing some platonic universe that you don't actually know how to express desire through your body and through your interpersonal interactions with people? Do you know that your desires are actually grounded in the world that you are aesthetically related to that you're inside of and you're interacting with and our desires are being pulled at us continuously through the hyper real environment that we're in that we are spending our time on right and advertising and apps and you know all of this kind of limbic hijacking is retraining our sense of desire or i guess maybe you would say not retraining but taking our evolutionary weaknesses like our desire to look at beautiful faces and exaggerating them to some kind of like a homunculus, you know, this like strange homunculus of human existence that's about the weaknesses of our evolutionary proclivities with mm -hmm. leaving out, you know, the question of how do you live a, a balanced life? Um, and I mean, and I think these are upstream of the question of, of dating. This is, this is more fundamental than how do I find a girlfriend? Like, like this, these are deep questions. Um, so but yeah, that's my answer. Well, it sounds like you're making the Ubermensch case know of like, you have to figure out like, shit, what are the desires actually there for in the first place? And then provide what that was meant to provide because you can't trust it with all the modern influences. Like, am I picking up what you're putting down? I think that there there's something to that. Yeah, that, that the, the influences that we have and like the nudging that's just like, especially if you spend any time on the internet, like that type of environment is highly manipulative. Like you have to understand manipulation and passive aggressive behavior in order to understand the internet and how it's functioning in an invisible way. There's also direct aggression, but like the more insidious stuff is happening in the background. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's such a multifaceted thing to get into because there's also the level of like, what are pro-social behaviors? Well, they're kind of, if you, if you cultivate pro-social behaviors in your personality and turn yourself into somebody that you want to be around and that other people want to be around, you'll probably also solve the dating problem. Like that kind of comes along with the development of a self that where your promises are credible. People can trust you in the future that you're going to do what you say, you know, that you are there for them when they need you. Like all of this stuff is about, are you a credible person in the future? And that is the thing that's breaking down particularly with optionality. Um, we have a hand raised, so I wanna get to that and then we're probably gonna wrap up. We're gonna go a little over just to get to this last question. Um, and Jacob, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes, thank you. Um, and James, you mentioned uh, uh, that book that talked about the um, Scandinavian countries. And I was, uh, as soon as you mentioned that, I was thinking about Japan. 
in 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 Japan there there for a long time there there have been there, there has been this phenomenon of the um well disenfranchised man hikikomori hikikomori you know that's right and my question is i think i once heard that some of those are they aren't aren't really that miserable they say well i got my video games i got my entertainment i got my food i got my shower i'm doing all right um and you know virtual reality is keeps getting more fancier and fancier so sounds like a bit like a black mirror episode but how 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 realistic do you think and Ra raven you can answer as well of course how realistic is it that well there are a lot of people men and women without partners but it's okay they got uh, virtual entertainment and you know maybe even virtual sex or something like this mm -hmm. yeah i mean like shut-ins hikikomoris um yeah yeah i mean there's there's a concern in japan that when their parents die that like what what, what are these people going to do because at the moment it's lots of typically young men living with their parents um and then when the parents dies is what the hell's going to happen but uh, but i i think that's an interesting point about can it's almost as if can technology solve the incel problem in some ways because um can you kind of pacify people with i mean pornography ai sex robots virtual reality um just re regular computer games so you don't need to so they're not obsessed with kind of women's validation uh, anymore i would say like for, for some people i think you know i would say that you know the intel community gets told there are people in, in the intel community who are have asperger's or you know autism um they are like 25 percent, i think in one of the forums of surveyed i think 25 percent have some form of autism so it's very hard to in many ways to to socialize and go and approach a woman in a bar or something um some people have facial disfigurements and it's very hard for them to go on a dating app and, and find a partner. So I think for some people, it is, it is a good idea not to make, to stop making women the focus, the central point focus of, of their life and to actually try and find some other purpose and throw everything into that. Um, it's easier said than done. I mean, it's, it's a bit like someone with, with money saying, oh, money doesn't matter. You know, a rich person saying, oh, it doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter. It's, um, it's easy enough for someone, for someone uh who 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 does have a partner or whatever to say oh don't worry about don't worry about relationships or whatever but but yeah i mean th there is a uh, chance that technology may be used more and more to kind of um mollify those people who like the kind of like the soma from huxley's like brave new world where they give them the soma drug and they kind of they're just kind of pacified but i mean is that is that you know i i could see that quite see that happening but is that is that what we want and and you know there are lots of feminist arguments against things like ai sex robots that you know that rooting around women um object and objectifying women as just this object that you kind of that you have sex with like a a meat sock to kind of jack off into that that's that's going to have negative consequences on society in the same way that they would argue that pornography does um and I, I, I mean, to some extent, I agree with that. So I'm not sure. I, th I think it would be better for them to find some productive role in society um, and to be a part of society. I mean, I've gone through phases where I've spent a lot of time in the house and I've played a lot of computer games. And I, on one, and I was a spectator, like a passive spectator through through life. And on one level, yeah, it was gratifying, um, but then looking looking back at that from like a bigger a wider perspective having like it it doesn't kind of match up to the kind of the real life kind of experience the real life experience of being with someone romantically or just kind of engaging with the world and taking on challenges and whatever i think it's kind of the easy way out in, in some ways although i can understand it from the perspective of some people yeah yeah i guess i would just add that i think it's a uh, it's a wedge issue um, because it will, in line with this uh, question of inequality, that for the subset of people who will continue to pair up and reproduce, 
um, this type of uh, satisfaction of sexual desire, I think, will be seen as a, kind of an ideological enemy uh, to their interests as a population. And you can see that already happening. Like this is mating, just like Jeffrey Miller, like I had an interview with him earlier, uh, talked about how mating systems are kind of upstream of social and political dynamics, right? This is the whole ideological component of this. And I think that it would, it seems impossible for me that that wouldn't become a wedge issue in, in, in the culture about there being uh, kind of pacification of men through the use of technological intervention, VR, VR pornography, hyper real stimulation, AI robots. And those people for, to some demographic will be considered to still be losers, even if their individual lives are improved. Um, and I think that the other thing about this is that it's not a long-term solution because we have to repopulate in order for there to continue to be a species into the future. And I think like that is something that is very left out of this whole conversation is what are we even dating for? Why do we even have these drives or impulses to begin with? And it's because we have an imperative to reproduce in order to create future, the future as such, like the future of human consciousness on the planet is determined by whether or not there will be children to inherit the world that we've created. Um, and it seems like that is collapsing. You can only have one generation or maybe two generations or of people who are pacified and don't find and find a person of the opposite sex to reproduce with. And so the, the possibility of this is just a huge population collapse. There are countries that are concerned about this. I think Japan is one of them. So is the UK. The replacement rate of reproduction, I think, in, in the UK is like 1.2 right now. Um, so we're going to see aging populations without young people to take on jobs. And I mean, this has quite like the level of kind of existential crisis that this is for individual countries. And then also for the globe, um, it really reaches into all of these other types of things about the future and the credibility of the future that we're all going towards. Is this a future that we want to be in? And, uh, this gets into the small side of like, can you, can you bet that the person that you just went on a date with is going to call you back or are they just going to ghost you? Is, is their presence here something that you can believe in? Or do you just believe that they're going to ghost you and they believe that you're going to ghost them and so you just don't invest at all? So there's that problem on the individual relational level. But then there's also these larger kind of time scales at which the stuff is ricocheting into. Um, and the technological solution to the incel problem is short term, it creates a massive consumer base, but will also have these population collapse effects and probably lead some people into having worse off lives um, and maybe all of us. So, I, you know, it's all of this stuff highly complex. Um, I'll know, James, if you want to throw in something after, after that spiel, um, but we're going to be closing out soon. So why don't you take the floor and leave us with some final thoughts and ideas and maybe let us know What's in the future for you? How are you going to be um, tackling the subject in your journalism, in your podcast? How is this coming forth into your work? Yeah, I mean, so so with my work, for example, I mean, the next the next kind of year or two, I'm going to be looking at this more in depth. So it's 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 not just the incel thing, but it's also kind of how people are being radicalized in the first place. I think the mention was, you know, dating is upstream from societal things but i think it's also the other way around so i mean if we go back to 2010 there was an interesting book called the shallows about how social media and and these things are kind of affecting the way we think um and i think dating apps are affecting the way you know changing culture in a similar way that social media has changed say politics so i mean you, you i think we're seeing that feeding through now with um i think memes weirdly i think memes are one of the first place you see some of these things feeding into the mainstream and some of the vocabulary and the language is built on certain assumptions and then the language comes into the mainstream and some of those assumptions come in come along with it so i think that um i will be looking at some of that stuff in more depth but not just like the intel thing but also kind of the the other other side of it so like the dambles areas of the world and and kind of um how for example there's there's a big culture on instagram of 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 like men who think that they need to create the perception of like a high status lifestyle to actually get the kind of partner they want and our economy no longer supports the that you know there is no rags to riches story there is no meritocracy it's the american dream is dead 
both in in Europe and in the United States, there is no you are not going from. I'm sorry, but you're not going from being the poor person to being to being the millionaire. Yeah, one in a million, one in a billion that happens, but it's typically not happening. The economy does not support someone to go and become rich anymore. So you have fake it till you make it. So you have this manipulative stuff. You have these uh, groups on social media like Instagram, which which teach people how to fake it and look like they're traveling on private jets or whatever because they're never going to do that. They're never. There's no economic role for them which is going to actually support them to have a good lifestyle so i mean the economy underlies some of the stuff also looking at how technology may be used as a kind of as as was mentioned as, as kind of a uh an escape hatch for society so you can pacify these men you can solve the incel problem by kind of palming them off palming sex robots off on them and whatever and also the kind of the high beauty standards have changed i think that's an interesting one so lookism has become much more of a, a thing now so um, men undergoing extreme cosmetic surgery has gone up like massively in recent years. Men using anabolic steroids, men taking like testosterone replacement therapy. That is a slightly different problem because testosterone levels are going down on average because of our sedentary lifestyles and other reasons. Um, but there's kind of this, this kind of equality was supposed to mean that uh, the beauty standards that are kind of imposed on women, it would free them up to be a bit more kind of um, so they wouldn't have to, obsess about those things so much but i think capitalism has taken us the other way so now they market those those things to men as well so men face those pressures as well or more and more i wouldn't say it's quite equal yet but i i think it's it's it's, it's rapidly uh, getting there so i will be looking at that kind of whole ecosystem um in a project uh which will be um well it's the next year or two basically but that is my closing thoughts i'm kind of just selling some project that doesn't quite exist yet, but watch this space. <laughs> watch this space. Yeah, this well, space. it sounds very interesting. I really look forward to um, seeing what you come up with in those areas. Um, yes, very, very much so. Thank you for coming here and sharing your thoughts and ideas with us today, the Rebel Wisdom Campfire. It's really been a very lively conversation for me. I've, I found this to be very generative and I hope uh, our audience has too, and that you also have. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. And sorry about this slight technical glitch earlier on. Oh, yeah. I had already forgotten about it, but thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, we'll be having another session on sex and culture uh, next month in October. Uh, so we'll be announcing that pretty soon here. And um, yeah, thanks, James, for coming here. And over and out. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you'd like to join conversations like this, Check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes. And you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.